Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare After Pariksha Maharaj heard from Sukadev Goswami about the pastime of Britrasura and how he was killed and at the time of his death he prayed with beautiful verses towards Bhagavan. Pariksha Maharaj became curious how it was that such a great demon was actually a pure devotee. And so he asked Sukadev Goswami, how is it that even though he was such a ferocious demon, really he was a pure devotee. So then Sukadev Goswami described that actually in his past life he was named Chitraketu Maharaj. Prishamars asked that we see pure devotees are very rare. Out of 8,400,000 species of life, and we see like ants and flies and mosquitoes, there's billions and billions and billions. I read somewhere that in like one or two acres of land, in some places you can find as many ants as there are human beings in the whole world. So each of these ants is a living entity. And then there are all the mosquitoes, all the bacteria, all the aquatics. These are all jivas, living entities. So there's 8,400,000 species of life. Of those, 4 lakhs is different kinds of human species. So out of trillions and trillions of divas, to become a human being is considered very rare, correct? And out of all those human beings, one maybe, uh, one out of many thousands may be interested in achieving perfection. Out of those who achieve perfection, or muktas, to find a pure devotee of Lord Narayan is extremely rare. So that's why Pariksha said, how is it that such a great demon was really a pure devotee? So then Sukadev Goswami told the story of Chitraketu Maharaj. Chitraketu Maharaj was the king of the kingdom called Sudasen. And he had many thousands of wives, but he was very sad because he could not have a son. He was always lamenting that he could not have a son. And so one day, Angira Rishi, a famous sage, came to the kingdom of Chitraketu Maharaj and inquired about his welfare. Chitraketu Maharaj said, I am happy in all regards except for one great sadness. My life would be complete if only I had a son. Especially for kings, if they don't have a son, then there will be no one to continue on in their generation to maintain the kingdom. So he was always lamenting. And he asked the sage, please give me a boon that I may have a son. So Angira Rishi said, yes, I'll give you some special kir and give it to your prominent wife, whoever you like, and she will have a son. But he warned him, that son will be the cause of great happiness as well as great distress. This is the nature of the mundane world it is full of dualities with happiness comes distress with joy comes sadness with dark comes light the material nature is full of dualities so he said your son will be the cause of great joy as well as great sadness so in due course his wife had a son and for some time he was extremely happy his wife and him were overjoyed and they would always be playing with their baby boy but what happened is that the co-wives of the king became very envious as is their want, because the king began paying all attention to his wife who had had the son, and he began to neglect the other wives. And especially to live as a co-wife is very difficult. And if you have hundreds of other queens who are all co-wives, and your husband, the king, is paying all attention to one queen, then naturally you become very envious. And also, now they would all be like her maidservant, because that boy would grow up to be the king. And so they would all be his servants. And so that's another reason for their envy. So some of these queens began to plot together what to do. First, they would speak together and convey their kind of envy. And the danger in this world is that out of envy, so much uh, violence can erupt. When envy boils up more and more, they have a, uh, a principle in regard to poverty. They say the most theft and crime happens not where there are only poor people, but where there are poor people living next to wealthy people because they become envious of the wealthy people. This is uh, done by statistics. The most crime happens in those kinds of areas. So naturally, this queen's enviousness increased more and more until finally they decided to poison the boy. Right? So they plotted together. One day when the uh, king and queen were not present, the boy was in his afternoon chamber, being in his, in his, like in his bed, in his crib, and they snuck in and gave him poison and he d died. Uh, that short time later when the queen came back to find her son, she saw him stiff and lifeless 
And she began to call out like a mother cow that has lost her, ca lost her calf. In great distress, she was weeping. And hearing this, the king ran and came there. And he also saw it and he began to loudly cry. He was loudly crying and sobbing as if, you, if your newborn baby has just died. And for so long, they'd been trying to get this, this child. And yet after he had come, only a short time later, he was poisoned and died. So at that time when they were lamenting like this, then sometime later again, Angira Rishi came. And Chitra Ketu Maharaj fell at the feet of Angira Rishi and said, please tell me why this has happened to me. So Angira Rishi said, I told you before that your son will be the cause of great happiness as well as great distress. You cannot avoid this. With life comes death. With birth comes death. You cannot avoid it. It's like two sides of the same coin. Someone who is born must die. Krishna says in the Gita, Even though the material body is destined to die, still the Atma lives on. So in that you can take hope. Krishna says in the Gita, When the body is killed, the soul is not killed. So Angirishi said, look, his Atma is still living on. And that Atma is what you are attached to. The body is made of dead matter. You are not attached to the body. Really, you are attached because of the presence of the soul, the presence of life. No one's, otherwise, you would be happy now. The body is still there. If you are attached to the body, then you can embrace the body, keep the body in your room. But because the life is left, consciousness is left, and life is left, therefore you are lamenting. So this shows you are attached to the soul. But because you are bound in ignorance, you cannot recognize the difference between the body and the soul. And so you're attached to the false conception of self, which is the material body. But in actuality, there is neither father nor son. The Atma has no material father. The father of the Atma is Parameshwar Krishna. Krishna said in the Gita, I am the father and the mother and the creator of all beings. In the Sastra it said, Amritasya Putra, we are the sons of divine immortal uh, the absolute truth, the immortal absolute truth who is the abode of ananda, bliss. So that is the real, uh, the, our creator is our real father and mother and our real beloved and friend. In, uh, in the Gita, we also, like in the Stuti to the Gita, we say, Tomeva Matava, Tomeva Pita, Tomeva Bandhu, Tomeva Saka. You are my mother, you are my father, you are my friend, you are my life and soul. So Angirishi said, all these family relationships we develop are all based on Maya, ignorance. And our attachment to these bodies is what keeps us bound in samsara. And especially that bondage in samsara is uh, symptomized by family attachment. In Hindi we say samsara means family life. Samsara means someone who is a family man or a family person. This is the meaning of samsara. So the material ocean of birth and death will not continue on without attachment to family life. In the Bhagavatam, it said that because of the attraction between man and woman, then all the bondage of samsara begins. And we perpetually migrate throughout one species of life to another. So then Angira Rishi said he in some way calmed him a little bit. But he said, look, if you want, I can bring the Atma back into the body of your son and he will come back to life for a short time and you can see him and meet with him. So the king and his queen were very eager to th for this and they said yes. So Angira called back this powerful sages they have the ability to bring someone back from the dead because the consciousness is still present especially after death the short time after death generally what the atma does is he will come out in the subtle body and in a way that is unperceivable to the mundane eyes they will be present and if some sages there or some powerful forces there they can summon that soul back into the body we see in medical cases near death experiences sometimes people come back into their body after hours even their heart is stopped, everything is stopped, and then they come back into their body. And it defies all laws of science. So the boy came back into his body and he sat up. And the king and the queen were overjoyed and they embraced him. And they, and they said, why did you leave? So he said, we all come and go in this world according to our karma. The body is with us as long as we have a uh, certain span of karma in this body. When this karmic balance in the body is ex uh, finally diminished and le has left, then we'll leave our body. As long as we have prarabdha karma, meaning karmas that are being uh, realized in this life, 
in destined for this body, then we'll continue to live. And once the karma is spent, then we'll leave this body. So for me, my karma was that I would live until I was this old and then I left. But you should not lament. It's not a cause for lament. A similar pastime happened with Mahaprabhu Sankirtan. Shiva's Pandit's son also left during Sankirtan. And Mahaprabhu also summoned him back. And he said the same thing. Who is the father? Who is the mother? When they said, why did you leave your father and mother? He said, who is the father? Who is the mother? Krishna is the father and Krishna is the mother. In many, many millions of lifetimes, I've had many fathers and mothers. So the boy said, the Chitra Ketumar's son said, when I was a pig, I had a pig mother and a father. When I was an ant, I had an ant mother and father. In some species, mother and father is one. <laughs> like in some kind of bacteria, you know, or worms. Some are like, you know, you could be born from one. But in all different lives, we have so many different parents. So he said, which father and mother are you? And immediately they became somewhat shocked from this. When we speak this to people, it's hard to realize it because we don't have that practical experience. But in the case of Chitraketu and his wife, their son died before their eyes. He came back to life. And then their son himself was speaking to them this truth. And so it was very easily uh, like, uh, digestible because of their attachment to their son. Especially if you hear from someone who you have relation with, you're more bound to trust them. And in this case, so they heard what their son said to them and it awoke some kind of uh, gyan, divine knowledge within them and they became somewhat peaceful. So after he told them like this that oh which father, which son, there are many fathers, many sons, I'm actually very happy I'm with Bhagavan. Then he again departed. So after this Chitraketu Maharaj asked Angira for some kind of sadhana. When we perform spiritual life, there's a verse about the glories of Guru. And it says, Tazmad Gurung Prabhadeta Jigyasu Shreya Uttamam Shabde Parechanishnatam Brahmani Upasamashrayam. Tazmad means therefore. And in the Sastra, this also connects to the first verse of Brahma Sutra, Atato Brahma Jigyasa. Ata Ato. That means now, therefore. Now means at once. It's very important. And then Ata means therefore, or hence. So tazmat, it means therefore as well. So it means once you have experienced the suffering of material life, then desire for emancipation may arise within the heart. That's why we see suffering in this world. Because without suffering, we will be unable to achieve our full potential and realize true ananda. We will be living in this material kind of status quo of birth and death. And in some regions, like we see in the lower planetary systems, they don't experience old age and disease and sickness. They live their lifespans, they're eternally youth, always youthful. When their karma has left them, then they give up their bodies. These are in the lower subterranean regions. They don't see the rising of the sun, and so they don't have so much conception of time. And the life passes in merriment, and ultimately, Sudarshan Chakra comes through and kills them all, and they go to their next bodies. But they're completely absorbed in materialistic life, and they don't think about a higher dharma. So in this earth planet, where we have death and suffering, it's called... Martya Loka, Mrityu Loka, the abode of death. The earth region is the abode of death. In other regions, the lower regions, you're experiencing happiness or suffering, but you don't so much perceive the reality of death. It comes suddenly. It said when Surashan Chakra comes into the subterranean regions, all the wives have miscarriages in fear. And then they're all, wherever they hi hide, they're all burnt to ash, and then they achieve their next life. But they're not so much aware of life, death, and, and uh, higher reason and spiritual pursuits. But on earth, we can do that. And once we've become exhausted in material life, then it said, Gocharam. Krishna is achieved by those who are materially exhausted. Kunti Devi prayed with one verse. Krishna is achieved by those who are materially exhausted. Those who are absorbed in uh, the enjoyments achieved by high birth, privilege, um, uh, beauty, status, and wealth. It's very hard for them to become spiritually aware because they are enjoying this world. So those who are actually fortunate, those who have had the f mercy of God shine down upon them, experience material suffering. So there's one, uh, that's why we should un understand suffering to be one kind of mercy to enable ourselves to become detached from this world. So when they experience the suffering of having their child die, 
They were materially exhausted and they prayed to Angira to give them some sadhana to achieve salvation. And Angira Rishi gave Chitraketu and his wife one mantra. He gave a mantra to Chitraketu called the Mahavidya Mantra, of worshipping Lord Narayan. And he taught them the process of sadhana and gave him many instructions on knowledge. Then, Chitraketu Maharaj, for one week, he began completely absorbing himself in this sadhana and mantra japa. Like Pariksha Maharaj, he spent one week hearing the Bhagavatam and he was liberated. So we shouldn't think it takes a long time to achieve liberation. It's depending on our sincerity and our degree of dedication in our practice. In the case of Chitra Ketu Maharaj, in one week he achieved salvation. Means he got darshan of the Lord. After one week only, after one week of chanting his mantra, he had darshan of Mahasankarshan, who was in a very beautiful form with bluish cloth, and he was surrounded by the four Kumaras. And he was extremely beautiful. So Chitra Ketu Maharaj began to offer prayers. Naturally, when you see the Lord, then your heart will swell with emotion and you will be inclined to offer prayers to the Lord. So Chitra Ketu Maharaj at that time began to pray to the Lord. And he described the Ashwarya, the opulence of the Lord. Because he was worshipping in the mood of opulence, not Madhurya. So he described that, O oh Lord, as Karanadakshai Vishnu, you lie in the cosmic ocean and millions and millions of universes stream through the pores of your body like smotes of dust going through the screen of a window. Such is the scale of the Vedic conception of reality. The Christian conception of reality is that we're in this one little universe created 5,000 years ago in a moment and the firmament is enclosing uh, the earth. We have the sky, the firmament, we have hell, we have earth. And outside of that, there's not so much other space. And that's it, that's the universe. And we have heaven and hell and earth. The Vedic conception is much broader. So Siddhartha Kedumar said, you lie in the cosmic ocean and millions and millions of universes are flowing through your pores. And as you exhale, all the millions of universes flow outside of your body. And as you inhale, all the universes flow back within your body. This is the original pranayam. The Lord in his exhalation and inhalation, all the universes are manifesting and we're living our lives. We can imagine in one exhalation, all the universes are expanding and appearing in this world. And during the lifespan of the universe, which is over a trillion years, we live like a hundred years in the human form. 100 years in trillions of years during one breath of Lord Vishnu. And in that span of his life, we have millions and millions of lifetimes, millions and millions of fathers and mothers and wives and children and husbands and relationships. And we think, my life is so important. I am so important. This false ego, which is the body. The body is the manifestation of ahankar, false ego. And we think, I am this body and I am so important. And what I'm doing in this world, my purpose in life is all so important. This, my mission is so important. This is all false ego. When we realize the nature of reality, then we see all these universes are floating in the ocean of manifestation, the cosmic manifestation like foam that is appearing and disappearing in an instant. In an instant, the universes are appearing in one breath. Lord Vishnu is eternally present. He, Chitra Ketu Maharaj prayed to Lord Vishnu, you are eternally present. And so in one of his breaths, and there are eternal breaths within eternal time, in each breath a universe is expanding, and in, as he inhales, it is being destroyed. And yet we think, I am so important. So he prayed to him like this with many verses. And then after having darshan of the Lord, the Lord blessed him and disappeared. So at that time, Chitra Ketu Maharaj continued living, at that time, he went to Vidyadara Loka. This is one uh, planetary system in the cosmic 14 planetary systems of the lo uh, the universe. So he was living there with many Vidyadaris, many beautiful damsels. And he became friends with Shiv Thakur. So Shiv Thakur and Chitraketu were god brothers because they're both worshipping Mahasankarshan. So they're both like the followers of Sankarshan, Ram. Is one expansion of Baladev. So they are friends. Chitraketu and Mahadev Shiva are friends. 
So one time when Chitraketu was in his heavenly vehicle, like an airplane, we see like, not like the airplanes we have now where we have a small seat and we get strapped in. It's very wonderful airplanes that can travel at the speed of thought even. And you have all kinds of facilities for enjoyment on that airplane, waterfalls and valleys, all kinds of enjoyment are there. So as he was there, one time he came to Kailash where Shiva was sitting uh, with his wife Parvati and he was giving kata, he was giving discourses to an assembly of many sages but Shiv Thakur was sitting naked with Parvati in his lap and seeing this scene Chitraketu Maharaj chuckled and he said oh just look at Mahadev he is giving Harikata to everyone while sitting naked with his wife on his lap he didn't like ridicule him but he was just seeing the humor of the situation because he knows Shiva is Jitendriya. He has conquered his senses. He is undisturbed. He is always absorbed in the bliss of divine yoga or bhakti with Bhagavan. So when Chitraketu laughed like that, Shiva did not become disturbed. But his wife Parvati immediately became offended. And she cursed Chitraketu Maharaj. So in the stories of Sati or Parvati, this is one of the examples of one of her mistakes she made. That she cursed a devotee. It said, when you curse someone or bless someone, all your spiritual potency is lost. Therefore, sadhus generally do not bless or curse. They say, if you ask for blessings, Bhagavan may bless you. Take shelter of Krishna, he may bless you. Shakti Devi, or Radharani, or the goddess may bless you. But directly, I will not give blessings or curse. Because then all your Shakti is lost. So, Chitraketu Maharaj accepted this curse. He could have rejected it and let it return. But if you don't, if someone curses you, and you uh, are able to repel it, then it will come back to who spoke it and will cause their own destruction. So he didn't want Mata Parvati to have any harm caused to her. So therefore he accepted it. She cursed him that because of your demonic vision and your criticism of Shiva and me, you'll be born as a demon. And so he folded his hands, accepted this curse, and he was reborn as Brithrasura. And then... That pastime of Brittra Sura and his fight with Indra was told in the Bhagavatam. So, this is the story of Chitraketu Maharaj. Please subscribe down there for our channel and hit the bell icon for notifications and share this with your friends. Radhe Radhe.